Good morning. Uh, the US, finally, we're back. We're back here. Uh, we're going to look at um, some of the realist painters. And it's really difficult because some of them don't really belong to realism, but I had to put them somewhere. And chronologically, they, they uh, work in that period, but some have enough personality that you cannot pigeonhole them in, in just uh, realism. So let's uh, remember what's happening in the history of the United States at that time. And I think that's an interesting uh, map because it shows you all the purchases that happened during that time that made makes what we are now. Uh, so of course the original uh, 12 states, 13 states, sorry, uh, in 1783. And then we have the <clears throat> Louisiana, Louisiana purchase in uh, 1803 in white. Uh, the Spanish session of West Florida and uh, East Florida in 1819. Um, the Texas annexation in 45, the Mexican session in 48, and up north the Oregon Territory from with uh, following the treaty with United Kingdom uh, of 1818, but it becomes only territory in 1846, plus the little Gadsden purchase in 1853 from Mexico. So uh, I'm not even talking about Puerto Rico and so on. But that it shows that this is a very busy century when you look at it. Just a few facts and what changes really the nature of art is very much linked to, uh, to the, the inventions that happen there because life is changing, communication is enhanced, uh, everything is starting to go faster and definitely by the end of the century with the car and the airplane, it becomes much faster. But even the, come in, come in. Uh, but even just the, the electricity, uh, having the, the light, you have a leaflet there in front of you. So 1840s, because of course, as you know, sometimes uh, an invention comes from multiple people that's put together. So I put in the 1840s, we have the electrical telegraph. 1850s, we have railroads. Uh, the um, tenure of Abraham Lincoln, presidency of Abraham Lincoln between 61 and 65, that corresponds to the Civil War. Uh, the 63 to 67, which considered the reconstruction era. And then uh, 1890s to 1920s, the progressive era, that again is corresponding to a lot of these invention that happened then. It's gonna completely change uh, life. A lot of the names that we're going to see here in, with the tycoons are gonna be these first very large art collector that are going to start a trend that's going to be followed by smaller collectors then because as you know it's always kind of a role model so among the tycoons i've picked up four that are the, the biggest names cornelius van der Bilt, uh, who was in railroads and shipping rock uh, rockefeller with petroleum andrew carnegie with steel jp morgan with banking and then the main, uh, and again, this is just a pick by me of uh, three main inventors, Henry Ford with the automotive, automotive industry, Thomas Edison, electric light, power utility, sound recording, motion pictures, and Nikola Tesla, not to forget him, though he had been forgotten for quite a while until the car was named after him, mm -hmm. uh, but was uh, the inventor of AC induction motor and transformer and rotating magnetic field. Very important and fortunately has been revived in a sense. So this is just a sample of all the novelty that happens in one century which is compared to the century before, it's amazing. Just a little timeline that gives you an idea 
uh, that all these uh, painters are pretty much contemporary. And it also shows you that, okay, the French realism is pretty much at the lead in that uh, century with Courbet and others, but Courbet is the main figure and the most international too. We're going to talk about Whistler, Homer, Eakins, Chase, and Sargent. Um, and then I put at the bottom, I put Claude Monet because he's an impressionist and there he is totally contemporary with all these American realists. As you know, American impressionism comes very much at the end of the century, uh, a little delayed because they're not uh, in direct contact, though they influence by it. So the first figure, and he's for sure the one that is not really a realist. He's sometimes, it looks impressionism. It's him. Let's put it that way. It's the Whistler style. Um, James Abbott McNeil Whistler was born in 1834 in Lowell, Massachusetts. His family moved to St. Petersburg in 1842, where he entered the Imperial Academy of Fine Arts and uh, that's going to be uh, interesting because it was a very important school at the time. St. Petersburg had amazing teachers and is going to have it all along the century. Uh, in 1848, his father died, and so the family moved to Connecticut. Uh, in 1855, he moved to Paris, studied with uh, Glare. That's one of these uh, side academies. Uh, the, that taught him that line is more important than color and that black is the funda fundamental color of tonal harmony. Uh, he met there Fontaine Latour, Courbet, Manet, Carolus Durand, uh, Baudelaire and uh, Théophile Gautier, also some musician of the time. And Whistler, as we know by the title of many of his works was very, very fond of music. So for him, that was important. In 1859, he moved to Paris, despite regular trips to Paris, where he's, he stays in close contact with Courbet until something breaks up their friendship. And we'll talk about that. 1866, he visited Valparaiso, Chile, uh, and started his first, what they call nocturnals. And these are uh, terms that are normally used in music, but not in uh, painting. Uh, in 1878, he's going to go during about a year uh, on that terrible uh, Ruskin trial. And we'll talk about that too, which is going to be a problem. It's going to be followed by a bankruptcy. And uh, being bankrupt, he goes to Venice to see some friends over there. and. Uh, for sure, looking for solace. Uh, 1886, he was elected president of the Society of British Artists. 1888, he married Beatrice uh, Godwin, uh, that died in 96, and moved to Paris in 92, returned to London in 96. As you can see, he was a big traveler and died in London in 1903 and is buried in Chiswick Old Cemetery. He ended up having a really interesting uh, signature, what we call the butterfly signature, uh, that he developed in the 1860s of his, uh, out of his interest of uh, Asian art and started doing a butterfly and then it became more and more abstract. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually had studied the potter's marks on China that he had started to collect and decided to design a monogram of his initials. So over, over the time, this evolved in the shape of an abstract butterfly. And then around 1880, and that corresponds also with his trouble with Ruskin, he added the stinger to the butterfly image uh, to create a mark representing both his gentle, sensitive nature and his provocative, feisty spirit. He always actually, uh, took great care where he was positioning his uh, signature on the paintings. He is uh, very much part of what we call the aesthetic movement. And the aesthetic movement that had started in a very small way in the 1860s 
in uh, studios and houses of the uh, group, a radical group of artists, including William Morris and Dante Gabriel Rossetti, uh, was really the result of that group of angry young reformers who were exploring some new way of living in defiance of what they call the horrendous design standards of the age. And um, that was revealed in the 1851 Great Exhibition. And so that aesthetic movement, as you can see, it, it's art for art's sake. So it's moving away from narrative, from content, in fact, to just uh, appreciate the art for, for itself. So art should be independent of all claptrap, should stand alone and appeal to the artistic sense of eye and e or ear without confounding this with emotions entirely foreign to it as devotion, pity, love, patriotism, and the like. So definitely there, they move against romanticism when they say that. With the pity and so on, they're looking at the realism that you can see with Millet and so on in France who are looking at the uh, the blue color class and people that were really struggling to, to make it. Uh, so for them, uh, this is just the idea. The slogan itself, art for art's sake, uh, was uh, originated with the French poet Théophile Gautier. So let's look at some of the extraordinary work of Whistler. He's, I must say, one of my favorite artists and very much cutting at the cutting edge of what was done then. He is doing things that uh, is only gonna be done much later in France. Uh, these are the two portraits that you see. He model, the uh, young model, Joanna, Joanna or Joanna Hiffernan uh, that uh, he liked. She was an Irish girl, had marvelous reddish hair uh, and a really uh, pretty face. So the one on the left is the first one that uh, he created. And that was seemed to be just a study uh, in white and just showing how you can differentiate two different kinds of white and still make it uh, quite alive. Uh, this, some, you know, had different uh, interpretations. Some thought it was an allegory of a new bright lost innocence. Other uh, thought that it was linked it to a novel that uh, appeared at that time, The Woman in White, that was a very popular novel. Um, they also look, and I agree on the one on the left, that it looked very much like the pre-Raphaelite movement, which is contemporary too, and that we will see early next year. Uh, she holds a lily in, the, uh, in her left hand and stand upon, uh, upon a bearskin rug. That portrait was refused for exhibition at the Conservative Royal Academy, uh, and, but it was shown in 1863 at the Salon des Refusés in Paris, and they had quite a bit of success. It was only uh, second to the Déjeuner sur l'air by Manet uh, that upstaged it, but otherwise it was very much appreciated. So uh, going against the criticism of the, the traditionalist, uh, the Whistler's friends insisted that the painting was an apparition with a spiritual content. And it epitomized that theory that art should be concerned essentially with the arrangement of colors in harmony, but not a literal portrayal of the natural world. So two years later, he did the other one, which is different, as you can see, it's. Uh, no, having that, that lovely uh, play with the mirror next to her, uh, she seems also quite pensive, but he also plays with the Japanese art that he's discovered by then and uh, holding the fan in one hand and then the flowers that are very reminiscent to uh, Japanese arrangement. It is during that period, yes. No, that's where it, it, that's supposed to be. Oh, wow. Yeah, because you see his signature, the, it's 
A signature signature is down a bear, a whistler signature is a bear. Yeah, he did crop, and that's Japanese too. Okay. Don't forget Japanese, it's really uh, the the art that brought the cropping into uh, art in Europe. So you see very much Degas looking at that kind of thing uh, regularly. These are different models, right? No, they're the same. same. She's the same. Now, it's, it is during that period that Courbet and him became friends. Uh, and actually, as he was going to France, he was going with Hiffernan, and uh, she started modeling in the nude for Courbet. Uh, and that really enraged Whistler. And uh, we will see that that's going to, unfortunately, um, break apart the, the friendship that they had started. Also quite interesting is that it looks like Whistler was leading a pretty busy life, let's say. <laughs> uh, had numerous models and numerous mistresses. And there it happens. In January 1864, his mother drops in and he said, I'm coming to live with you. <laughs> Can you imagine his face when that happens? She's very religious and very proper. And she arrives in London that completely upsetting his uh, son, uh, her son, sorry, bohemian existence. And so he wrote to Henri Fontaine Latour, who is a French painter, general upheaval. I had to empty my house and purify it from cellar to eaves. <laughs> he also had to move his mistress to another location. So uh, looking for some, some uh, models, one day he didn't have any. And so he asked his mother to, to pose. And this is the origin of this famous portrait of the artist's mother, uh, which has become that kind of the epitome of the portrait of a mother. Mm -hmm. uh, she couldn't stand for the long period of time to, to pose. So she ended up sitting and she's sitting there in profile. She's 67 years old at that time. Uh, she is seated on a chair and uh, it, it's very interesting because you have that vertical back of the chair that is contrasted with the horizontals of the, the baseboard and, and the, the, uh, the floor. So she's dressed in black and wearing a white bonnet uh, and really kind of stands out clearly against the, the gray wall. So after the initial shock of her moving with her son, and I can really imagine that, that is hilarious to me. She apparently aided him considerably by stabilizing his life in a sense. Um, I, I can imagine if I was doing that to my grandson, I think he'd kill me. <laughs> um, so he helped uh, him, she helped him with his uh, domestic needs and then provided a kind of an aura of res respectability uh, that helped uh, him win some patrons that otherwise were a little put off. Yes. A sheet or the other book or a piece of wood? No, it's on a little, um, it's a foot warmer if you want. That was typical because if you sit with the feet on the floor, first of all, the floors were often cold mm -hmm. and that was removing it from the cold. But it's also, if she wasn't very tall, it was giving her a better posture than if she had the feet on the ground. And the, the whiteness of the mat on the picture on the yes. wall, does the picture have any significance? Because it has it's so polished. And it's a very powerful, but that's really the way Whistler plays with it. He has this marvelous contrast and, and that composition. It, it's really a, a perfect fit in the composition. And again, you can see one is cropped yeah. on the right. So that's very much the influence of Japanese art. But that has become such an icon. Uh, the painting was, per, yeah, actually, uh, it's interesting. The public reacted very negatively to the painting. Uh, they thought it was, uh, it was anti-Victorian, anti 
because of its simplicity. It was a time where fashion in England was, you know, the Victorian, you had these uh, apartments full of furnitures and laces and all kinds of things. This was so almost abstract mm -hmm. when you look at it. And so the people were put off. It almost burned in a fire uh, about the train during the shipping. Uh, the painting had been finally bought, uh, purchased by the French government. That was the first Whistler in a public collection and is now at the Musée d'Orsay, as you can see. During the depression, the picture was built as a million dollar painting and was a big hit at the Chicago uh, World's Fair. I wonder why he did not sign this one. Uh, that's a good point. I don't see anything except maybe up on the the on the, the curtain. There is some around there on the curtain. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to to mute you guys. <laughs> so just try to keep the the sound on. But thank you, um, Cynthia. Now one of his all the big um, scandal was the Peacock Room. And there, there is a, an incredible story. The Peacock Room was originally designed as a dining room in the townhouse uh, in London, Kes Kensington in, Lo in London, um, belonging to Frederick Richards Leland, who was a shipping magnate. Uh, Leland had engaged a British architect to remodel and redecorate his home. And the architect, Shaw, entrusted the remodeling of the dining room to Thomas Jekyll, who was another British architect, who was experienced in Anglo-Japanese style. Jekyll conceived the dining room as what he called the porcelain zimmer, the porcelain room, which was a great, great vogue at that time. It was a big fashion. Every large mansion had the porcelain room. Um, thank you, Pam. Yes, thank you. But Jekyll fell ill. And so Leland turned to his friend, Whistler, to finish the work. He went away, and when he came back, he couldn't believe his eye because he thought that Whistler was just going to finish a few details. The room was in beautiful green leather, uh, was a, a rather uh, unsophisticated room, just had the shelves to, to put the collection of uh, uh, Chinese and Japanese uh, vases that uh, Lenin had. And when he came back, Whistler had completely changed the room and had painted everywhere, as you can see with the, the peacocks and, and other uh, beautiful paintings in gold leaf. He really was taken aback, completely taken aback, and refused to pay Whistler for the, the proposed fee. So Whistler left the patron, and then he found a way to get into the room without the knowledge of Leland and painted uh, what is at the end there, and we'll see it more in detail here, two peacock fighting which represent actually Leland and Whistler fighting uh, in the room. Jekyll, who was so shocked at the sight of his room when he recovered, he returned uh, to the home and was later found on the floor of his studio covered in gold leaves. He never recovered and died three days later. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. So in 1879, and this is also at the same time as the problem he had with Ruskin, uh, he was forced to file for bankruptcy and Leland became one of his uh, collectors. So uh, he, there was an absolute war. So it's really interesting because he also painted that uh, image there of the princess from the land of porcelain. Um, that was then acquired by Charles Lang Freer, uh, the art collector, uh, that uh, following the purchase of that painting, purchased the whole, but that really in a very uh, secretive manner, purchased the whole room and transferred it to the US. And it's now in this, it's part of the Smithsonian collection in the Freer Gallery.
you can see it there. The gallery opened to the public in 1923. So it took, as you can imagine, moving a whole thing like this was uh, pretty destructive to do it. But um, let me show you a few things. So this is the famous uh, battle between the peacock that Whistler himself called art and money or the story of the room. And it's marvelous when you look at it. I don't know why I didn't like it. I think it's gorgeous. And here is the princess that shows a beautiful Western woman wearing a kimono and standing amidst Asian objects. Now, the entirely, the entirely is very impressionistic in the way he handles the painting. And you can think of Monet having his wife uh, dressed in the kimono. It, it's very similar in a way. And the model was Christine Spartali. Now, the white Japanese screen in the background may have been owned by, um, by Whistler himself. And I love the curve, it, it's so, so beautiful. Now, here is a view of the, the room um, between 1947 and 50, uh, where it's empty and uh, you can see some of the repair section and to the right, you can see the details of the West Wall before and after conservation. So that's before and that's after where they really uh, restored the, the place. They did, uh, in the forties, they didn't have the technique to it. So uh, there was again in the nineties, another uh, big restoration uh, moment that really helped. And you can see also here how they clean the ceiling compared to what it was. So it had lost its vibrancy. Also what they've done is that before they had closed the shutters, uh, to prevent the light to impact the interior. But then they decided that they were losing a lot of the details because of the darkness of the room. And so they now put a film outside the windows that prevents the bad rays the, 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 to, to enter. And so the, you have natural light now in it to, to appreciate it. A problem existed too is in the, the uh, display of the China there. When uh, Free bought the room, he started quickly collecting uh, Chinese porcelain and mostly the uh, Kanxi, uh, blue and white porcelain. And uh, it really took away from the room because it was too blue and white. And so finally, the, the free decide to replace it by the collection that they had in their, their vaults and put a bigger variety of um, vases and, and other porcelain items. The, and the room has been reopened pretty recently. I think in 16 or 17, it, it was closed for a couple of years. As I mentioned too, um, Whistler moving away from the uh, peacock room, uh, he started his nocturnes after being in uh, Chile. And this shows here the nocturne in blue and gold, old Battersea Bridge, painted between 1872 and 75. Uh, he is looking at uh, Japanese prints. And as we know, the, these wonderful prints of uh, decrypting Tokyo Edo at the time, and um, other views that are very, again, cropped very often in a, an unusual way for European painting, but also very simplified that put uh, just that, that pillar of the bridge there and not the whole bridge is something very unusual. So um, uh, 
this is where he starts, you know, in the early 70s when he's uh, pioneering these contempt, uh, contemporaneous uh, works with Monet at the time. They're very much in contact and Whistler is in great part responsible for bringing Monet's art to England. So uh, in these uh, paintings, you see the, the, these night in very muted and very poetic harmonies of hues, but a very precise uh, outline of the object. It is now that he starts to retitle many of his earlier works using terms associated with music, such as nocturne, symphony, harmony, study, or arrangement. Uh, a little later, there are a few of these that happened, but here's another one that was very controversial, but is extraordinary. Uh, the Nocturne in Black and Gold, the Falling Rocket. So this is uh, fireworks um, painted in 1875. Uh, and this is really going to, it's the critique of that painting that's going to start the trial with uh, Ruskin. So he exhibited the work at the Grosvenor Gallery um, alongside with works by Edward Byrne Jones, the pre-Raphaelite and other artists. Ruskin, who was a big, big name at the time, who was with himself a great artist, but was principally an art critic and a philosopher, um, had been a champion of the pre-Raphaelites and of Turner. And when he reviewed Whistler's works, uh, he attacked Whistler. He praised Byrne Jones, but attacked Whistler. And Whistler was outraged. And so in 1877, Whistler sued, uh, sued the critic uh, Ruskin for libel after the critic condemned his painting, this painting. Uh, Whistler, seeing the attack in the newspaper, replied to his friend George Bolton, it is the most debased style of criticism I've ever, I have had thrown at me, um, I've had thrown at me uh, yet. And so he went to his solicitor and drew up, uh, read for libel, which was served to Ruskin. He was hoping to recover the thousand pound plus the cost of the action. But when the case came to trial, Ruskin was sick, so never showed up at the trial. He had only his solicitor there. And Ruskin, uh, Whistler was such an odd personality that he kind of put off the, the, the jury, if you want. And he lost, I'm really making it a short story, but he lost and um, actually he didn't lose. Let's say he didn't get what he wanted. Uh, he, was awarded just a, a nominal damage, which really put him down because with the problem he had with uh, Leland, and so he had to go into bankruptcy. Can I just one? Yes. This is just a few years after Leland's mother. Yes. So I wonder, did Ruskin uh, review? His mother, maybe his mother, I I don't I haven't seen anything to that effect, but this one was a much more. It, it was a, a novelty compared to the mother. Mother was different, but this was so abstract yeah, that they that couldn't one. believe it. I know this, this one and the nocturne before and the mother. Yeah. So that same sprinkling and the curtain that was coming down by that same sprinkling yeah. of light. That... But this is very abstract. I mean, you really have to look for it to find exactly what it is. And, uh, and Ruskin, wasn't a very nice person. And for the time we have again, you know, to put our feet in their moccasins <laughs> to try to understand where they're coming from. Uh, so anyway, this was a big breaking point for Whistler where he got, uh, he really lost a lot of money and a lot of friends because he was expecting his friends to hold on for him and they didn't. Ruskin was so influenced that they wouldn't dare So that's the trial in 1878. Yeah. Though, as you know, he went to, to Venice, came back and went on painting. This is just another of his portrait, but that shows very much his very fast brushwork. When you see the way 
the dress is painted is just a long brush stroke. He was also, he, he did work with uh, engraving. And this is uh, absolutely extraordinary engraving here of the doorway. It's absolutely beautiful in the way he handles his, his uh, darks and lighter, the highlight. It's uh, so suggested, but it, it's fantastic. So an interesting uh, figure, finally, if a nun came back and she in, case, in fact uh, took care of uh, all the uh, succession, she wasn't making any money of the succession, but she helped the family to, to deal with the succession when he died. A much tamer type of personality is Winslow Homer, of course, born in Boston in 1836, apprenticed to uh, a commercial lithographer in 54, uh, turned down an offer to join the staff of Harper's Weekly and starts his uh, freelance career in 57 became finally illustrator for Valus Pictorial and Harper's Weekly, and then moved in 59 to New York. He attended class at the National Academy of Design in 63, and where his mother was trying to save money to send him to Paris. It's the time where Harper decided to send him to the front lines of the American Civil War. After the Civil War in 67, he did travel to Paris. Uh, then in 81, 82, spent two years in the English coastal villages of Colorcoke, Tyne, and Ware. 1883, moved to Parsnack, Maine, and died uh, at the age of 74 in his studio there in 1910. As I say, he's a much more traditional type of artist in his personality as well as his way of painting. Here is just an example of the uh, engraving that he would do for the Harper's Weekly, which were a uh, nice illustration uh, of uh, just scenes, very familiar scenes for people describing these young girls along the seashore. And he was very successful with his engravings at the Harper's Weekly. Of course, he took lots of sketches, did a lot of sketches during the, the war and it was apparently very, very hard on him. Um, he was even wounded, but decided uh, to, once he, come, he came back from the war, then he used his sketch to make some of the paintings that uh, you can see uh, like this one of prisoners from the front. But I think to kind of ease out of the war and to refresh, he started really looking at the countryside around him and just um, scenes that were very refreshing, that were much uh, more optimistic. And so you have, that nostalgia for a simpler time, if you want, uh, not only for him, but for the whole nation. And so he sees here, it really shows that maturity of feeling uh, in the crack the whip, it, it's just a draw, but you know, you all hold down and then it's the one that's not gonna be able to hold down who loses. But you have that magnificent landscape at the back and then the, the kids bare feet, just enjoying. You can feel the grass under their feet. This became extremely popular. <coughs> and it was uh, exhibited at the 1876 Centennial Exposition at Philadelphia. Uh, was one considered one of the finest and most famous painting with the next one, which is Breezing Up, where he shows also the coastline and the people working in boats or fishing, or sometimes even uh, helping people escape from ships that were uh, sinking. 
but very lively, very refreshing, very beautiful way of uh, painting. Despite all his success, though, he never uh, became rich. His uh, economic condition was always precarious. A lot of the paintings that he did towards the end of his life were watercolors. It became one of his favorite medium. And uh, with the three Fisher girls here, uh, this is very typical of his very light touch on the watercolor, as you know, watercolor is not forgiving. Oil, you can just wipe it off and start again with watercolor one, it's in the paper, it's in the paper. And he looked again uh, around him a lot and had the scene of uh, young hunters. Of course, one of his uh, very, the most renowned uh, type of painting is this one, which is wonderful. But uh, you look at it as a very spontaneous <clears throat> painting, which it wasn't because uh, to try to make the painting, he had bought some crows dead crows from some hunters, and then had a pelt of a fox that he put on the log to try to get the, the, the different colors of, the, uh, of the, the fox. Once he showed it to a friend of his who was a hunter, he says, these are no crows, because they were kind of sagging. They didn't look like they were. So he had to start again with the other crows. He, he observed, he started feeding them. He looked at them and then looked at the way they were flying. And so finally was able to reproduce something. And you have these ominous uh, crows that are there following, very hungry crows that are following the, the uh, fox who is not at ease at all to have these big birds and with the noise they make, as you know. Uh, and he slowed down because of the depth of the, of the snow. But it's absolutely beautiful the way that he composed that um, with that central fox. There, a few twigs that come out of the snow. It became one of the favorite of everybody. This is also his largest painting, and it was immediately purchased by the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, where it still is. Again, very different personality is Thomas Eakins. He was born in Philadelphia in 1844. As a child, was a very athletic person, did all kinds of sports. He studied drawing and anatomy at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in 1861, but was very he was a very scientific mind and uh, was quite interested by science. So he attended courses in anatomy and dissection at Jefferson Medical College in 64 and 65. Went to Europe where he studied art in Paris with Jean-Léon Jérôme and the portraitist Léon Bonnat, and then a winter in Spain. Uh, between 66 and 70. In seven, in, later on in the 70s, it was introduced to the photographic motion studies of Edward Muybridge, uh, who did all the studies of the horses and people walking and so on. He returned in 76 to, Pennsylvania, to the Pennsylvania Academy to teach as a volunteer, but so just not making any money, but very quickly in 78 became a salaried professor and director in 1882. During that uh, period, he married Susan Anna McDowell, the daughter of a Philadelphia engraver. But already in 1886, he's, he's forced to resign from the academy for a lot of controversial movement. He's a reformer and he is going, to, we'll, we'll see, he's trying to uh, make sure that the students don't study art just from plaster cast. He want living models, just as we have today where we have living models. And he loved nude models. Um, and this became a problem because the, the academy was, um, mostly mixed, so you had women and men, but men could be shown in the nude only for men. 
And sometimes he would just, the, a man would be posing in front of women with a loincloth and he would just take it off. To just, and this made a big scandal. And finally, in 1886, he was forced to resign uh, and then went on working. And in 1916, died of a heart failure in his studio. Very interesting uh, personality because he's got that scientific mind uh, that shows uh, in some of his uh, studies. Early on, he does a lot of these type of uh, uh, works with the skulls. As you know, if you've ever done skulls, it's very unstable, but it goes so fast, it's beautiful. And beautiful reflection in the water. He is, by the way, included in one of them. This is just uh, one of his uh, realistic portrait that follows his uh, time in France. Very beautiful study of the light and the impact of the light on the model. And the texture also, I think the wood versus the background and the carpet, and then that very, very lightweight dress worn by her. Probably one of his most uh, known painting is the famous Gross Clinic. Um, this shows actually the very renowned Philadelphia surgeon, Dr. Samuel D. Gross, that is presiding over an operation to remove part of a diseased bone from a patient's thigh. Uh, these were uh, done typically in the amphitheater at the Jefferson Medical College. It took him about a year on the painting uh, to just make sure they have all the portraits correctly because these are portraits of each person uh, and then every correct movement. And of course, Gross, the face of Gross is, is central to the painting, is absolutely superb. This is also one of his largest work and considered by many as his greatest painting. It was bought by the um, board of trustees of, at uh, Thomas Jefferson's University that agreed only in 2006 to sell it to the National Gallery and Crystal Bridge Museum of Art, American Art in Bentonville for a record of $68 million. At uh, just a couple of days later, a group of donors agreed to match the price in order to keep the painting in Philadelphia. And it still is there. This is the kind of thing that really put him in trouble. Is he was apparently, you know, sometimes he, he was seeing some models or some people doing, for example, a person carrying a model and not doing it properly and then dressing in front of other people in, in, in the nude would go and, and seize the model to, to have the same position. And so people were really put off by his, his attitude. So here are some examples of the pictures. So you can see the car posing for the ladies in the academy. And then down below that kind of thing, this is the kind of thing, this himself with the model, that famous thing that shocked everybody. But he made a, a whole series of paintings and this one is one where he's observing the way the, the, the horses uh, trot normally and it is based on his study with photography and uh, to just make sure that he has the, prob the proper cadence. And this is the 
Fairman Rogers driving a coaching party in his four in hand carriage through Philadelphia's uh, Fairmont Park. Also very known is this painting showing the swimming hole where he again represents himself. He's the one uh, on the left laying down. And that shows a side of his that a lot of people have been discussing, which was his sexual preference. And it seemed that there is pretty much a, a consensus that he was homosexual, uh, very attracted to the buttocks of his models. <laughs> But he's also, as we've seen before, he was just a fabulous portraitist. And this is the portrait of Walt Dwight uh, Whitman, uh, that, uh, which was, by the way, the poet's favorite uh, portrait of his. But also interesting that he did a study of Whitman in different poses, all in the nude. So, uh, it, he really had that interest in anatomy that unfortunately turned bad. But the, the portrait is absolutely superb. What? I never knew that Whitman posed for anatomy. Yeah, it's interesting. You, you, you can't imagine him doing that. Well, I can't because I know a lot about Whitman, but the, the general idea of no, that doesn't fit with that. But, no, you know, exactly. This makes perfect sense. And uh, I just think it's super amazing that he did that at that time. Yes. Uh, with Aiken. I, so Aiken just thought he had something else. Yeah. Plus, like, no and he wasn't doing body. like Mui Bridge. Mui Bridge was yeah. using simultaneous yeah. cameras to take things. Yeah. He he took it. It's taking with the same camera. It's multiple views. Yeah. So another very interesting uh, personality personality is uh, William Mary Chase, and probably the biggest teacher of the group that I'm showing today. Uh, born in Williamsburg, which is now Nineveh in Indiana in 49. He's enrolled in the National Gallery of Design um, under one of the students of Jean-Léon Jérôme in, in 69, moved to St. Louis, Missouri in 70, uh, settled at the Academy of Fine Art in Munich in 71 and 72, which was a big attraction too in um, uh, in Europe, you had Paris, uh, you had Munich, and then you had London. Uh, 77 traveled to Venice, returned to the US in 78, opened the studio in New York, which became very central uh, for young students. 78 to 1911 taught at the Art Students League. 1881 went on working tour in Italy, Venice, Capri, and then back to Germany got married in 1887, had eight children. In 1891, opened the Shinnecock Hills Summer School on Eastern Long Island. Uh, in 1896, opened the Chase School of Art that became the New York School of Art later on. 1896 to 1909, taught at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. 1914, taught at Carmel on the Sea and died at his home in New York City in 1916. Uh, pupil were among the pupils because he had tons of pupils, George Bellows, Charles de Most, Georgia O'Keeffe, who didn't care too much for him, by the way, Joseph Stella, uh, and Edward Charles Volkert, Edward Hopper, and many, many others. He was probably the biggest teacher of the time. And he is a much more conservative type of painter, but has a really good sense of texture and light. Uh, this is absolutely obvious in his uh, studio interior when you can see how the light strikes the wood in a way, uh, the metals or other textures all around. He was known for his flamboyance 
especially in his dress, in his manners, and most of all in his studio. It was a fantastic studio where people would gather and just be in awe. It was actually the old studio of Albert Bierstadt, who was known for his flamboyance too, by the way. So he filled the studio with lavish furniture, decorative objects, stuffed birds, oriental carpets, and exotic uh, musical instruments, as you can see some hanging on the wall. And wood, if I don't make a mistake, actually the one up there is wood. Is this in New York? Yeah. It was, uh, let's see if I have the address. I, I think I had the address uh, on it. But in 1895, the cost of maintaining the studio was so high that he finally had to close it and auction the content. He did a lot of, uh, of um, portraits. This is the tambourine girl, AKA Mrs. Chase as a Spanish dancer. That's the cheapest model, it's your wife, right? <laughs> and then Lydia Field Emmett on the right, one of the big family in uh, New York. But also he did some charming uh, paintings such as this one of Shinnecock on Long Island. Do you recognize that, Steve? Uh, no, it's <laughs> where. But beautiful, you, when you imagine that the, the spring flowers, you know, the, these shades of blue and pink, really beautiful. He also did some um, still lives, such as this one, the fish, large fish, that is in the Brooklyn Museum. But I think that what is fantastic is his uh, career as a teacher. Uh, not always appreciate because he was rather traditionalist and that's what uh, was, this is where uh, Georgia O'Keeffe was at art with him. And finally, we're looking at another great artist is John Singer Sargent, born in Florence in 1856, began, began his art studies with Carlos Duran uh, in se from 74 to 78, who was a, a young French artist whose atelier was progressive, but not, not the traditional academic approach, uh, though he required careful drawing. Uh, meet Degas, Rodin, Monet, and Whistler. Traveled to Spain in 78, visited Monet at Giverny in 1885. Moved to London in 86. In 87 to 88, did the first trip to New York and Boston as a professional artist. Uh, closed the studio in 18, 1907 and 1925 died of uh, heart disease. He's also a very uh, inventive uh, artist. And this is, for example, uh, just a wonderful early painting of the Spanish dancer El Jaleo, uh, painted in 7982 uh, with that amazing contrast of light and dark, of course, this is supposed to be at uh, not electrical light, but with uh, torches and candles. And then the dramatic uh, position of the dancer in the, to the right there, and the, the, the projection of the shadow on the wall is, I think, a very successful work. But he was also asked to paint. Um, some family portraits, though they're not traditional in the way he does. This is, you don't have a line of people sitting down and looking at you, but more people that are or are not in touch with one another. Uh, in this case, it's to me, recalls me some of the Degas work where you have four people in a room that don't talk to one another. And here you have that kind of lack of of interaction between the children, which is quite interesting. The daughters of Edward Darley Boyd. Um, he, people, some critics uh, talk about some influence by Velasquez in that painting, and particularly Las Meninas. One of the most scandalous portraits that he did 
is the portrait of Madame X. Uh, quite controversial, she was Madame Pierre Gautreau. I painted it in 1884, uh, for, and is now considered one of his best work, but was very much reviled when it came out. Uh, he himself thought it was one of his favorite and said, I suppose it is the best thing I've done when he unveiled it at, in Paris in, at the Salon of 1884. But it aroused such a negative reaction that uh, he moved, uh, literally Sargent moved to London at the time. What is interesting is that the fact that the décolletage is rather abrupt <laughs> for the time, but also at first he had one of these traps that was on the arm and what making it even more casual, which again for the time uh, was uh, scandalous. Uh, he actually really pursued her to make her portrait and told, said that I have a great desire to paint her portrait and have reason to think she would allow it and is waiting for someone to propose this homage to her beauty you might tell her that I am a man of prodigious talent. <laughs> it took him about a year to complete the painting. But uh, after seeing that portrait, uh, the French commission dried up and uh, he, as I say, was he actually contemplated giving up painting for music or business. He was. He, he he contemplated giving up painting and go to for music or business. And you can see on the left how it was. It's a very large portrait, and that that is it's there in his uh, studio. So he contemplated giving up because of because the, of the negative reaction to this portrait that he considered his best painting to them. Yeah, but it wasn't, wasn't it not only how he painted her, but the woman herself and who she was? I don't know about that, but I think it's more the way he represents her, that it, it, there is a lack of decorum, if you want, for the time, that really made it scandalous. And he... Yeah, he had started with early, you know, early paintings that show mm -hmm. a very big sensuality. In fact, uh, this is a painting he had done earlier of Rosina when he was in Italy, and it's beautiful. It's full of light, and it's it's so instantaneous. Um, but it also shows that sensuality that uh, people didn't care yeah, for. Was less realistic than the yes. skin yeah. and the decollete. Yeah. But nobody knows who Rosina is. And I have a feeling they knew who Madame X was. And she, I, I thought that I had read that she was not an appropriate woman to do woman that to, kind of a large painting. Yeah, that she could was, be. I didn't she read that. Yeah. preceded her, I, you know, you could say. He met Monet, and this is a representation of Claude Monet uh, painting at the edge of the wood with Madame Monet a little further. He visited him regularly. And one of his most famous portrait of children is this one, Carnation Lily, Lily Ross. Um, it's one of his first major success at the Royal Academy uh, in 1887, where he shows on site two young girl lightning lanterns in an English garden in Broadway in the cast walls. That was immediately purchased by the Tate Gallery. It's so beautiful. You can see he just redeemed himself there. But it, it's, it's wonderful, the, the, all the touch of the, the flowers and you, you can, it calls back the, the color of the dresses of the girl and the lantern. It's, it's quite so beautiful, exciting. yeah. And that white. And here is uh, Lady Agnew of Lochnow. Uh, he was at that time averaging 14 portraits per year. 
in the 90s. He would, he was very particular in the way he would approach it. He would visit the client's home to see where the painting was to hang. Mm -hmm. And then he would often review the wardrobe to pick the suitable dress. <laughs> and so some of the portraits were done in the client's home, but most often in his studio. He required eight to 10 sittings from his clients. Also, he would try, although, sorry, he would uh, try to capture the face in one sitting. He would keep pleasant conversation and sometimes take a break and play the piano for his sitter. He was referred to as the Van Dyck of his time. But he got, in a sense, he got tired of all the chatting. He said it was very heavy burden to carry, uh, to have to, to talk and find a conversation. And I assume not all these people were interesting either. And he traveled, as you know, and he did these just marvelous uh, watercolors, uh, the gondolier siesta. Again, giving yeah, I, I never would have, you showed me that, I never would have thought it. No. Sergeant. That's amazing. And then, as we know, he made some official portraits. Uh, these are Theodore Roosevelt on the left and John D. Rockefeller on the right. And the Rockefeller is done in his home in Ormond Beach, Florida. So that was a, a very full life with ups and downs, uh, being not being understood always is always, the, I think, the most difficult thing for an artist. So next time we move to almost to the opposite side of the world and we look at uh, realism in Russia. And when I say Russia, there will be some Ukrainian born artists, but at that time Ukraine was part of Russia. So uh, we'll, we'll see Repin in, uh, who is of Ukrainian origin. And this is the painter that you see, he is extraordinary painter, but spent most of his career in St. Petersburg where he was a great teacher too. So thank you for being there. I don't know if it's still raining or not, but I'm going to stop the recording and then please talk.